Okay, the lab this week, we are separating a mixture of three compounds. So we have a mixture of these three compounds, benzoic acid, 1,4-dimethoxybenzene, and 2-naphthol. And we're going to separate the three of them from a mixture. Now the way we're going to do this is we're going to use an extraction technique, similar to what we did last week. But the most important thing here is we're going to take advantage of their different acidities. Benzoic acid has a pKa of 4.17. 2-naphthol has a pKa of 9.9. .9. Now, if comparing those two, the lower pKa value, of course, is the most acidic. So benzoic acid is more acidic than 2-naphthol. Finally, the 1,4-dimethoxybenzene, it is not acidic at all. I'll put a pKa up here. It's about, oh, about 44. So it's not acidic at all. So of the three, benzoic acid is by far the most acidic then the 2-naphthol, and finally, dimethoxybenzene, 1,4-dimethoxybenzene is not acidic at all. So we're going to separate these based on their different acidities using extraction technique. Now, the procedure this week I have made into a flow chart. It's a, it's a complicated procedure. There's a lot of things going on. It's going to be easy to get things mixed up. And so that's why I put it in the flow chart. Hopefully you can follow along a little bit easier. <clears throat> I would recommend you're going to have a lot of tubes with all these different things in it. I would recommend I have some blue painters tape in there. Uh, there where the reagents are located. I would recommend getting some of the blue painters tape Put on your reaction tubes and label tube A, tube B, tube C, and tube D so that you can keep track of everything. Otherwise, you're going to forget which tube is which. We've got, like I said, we've got so many tubes. So I'm going to kind of go through the procedure and explain things at the same time. So let's take a look at a procedure. It says to dissolve... 180 milligrams of the mixture, the mixture of the three compounds, in two milliliters of T-butyl methyl ether. Now this is our solvent. So it's a, it's, a, it's a type of ether that is our solvent. T-butyl methyl ether is the exact name of it. And you're gonna put that into tube A. So you've got your mi mixture of the three compounds and the ether uh, in tube A. It says to that add approximately one milliliter of saturated sodium bicarbonate to tube A. Mix for three minutes. Now you know how to mix from last week. Put a septum on there and you can shake it for three minutes. So it didn't say put a septum but I expect you to remember from previous labs what to do. So put, a, put one of your septa on the top and shake it for three minutes. Now, sodium bicarbonate, we're adding saturated sodium bicarbonate. So what is the purpose of this? Sodium bicarbonate is a weak base. We have some acidic compounds. Putting in a weak base, let's think about which one it's gonna react with. We're gonna have an acid base reaction, but which one is it gonna react with? The weak base. Well, it's going to react with the most acidic compound that we have, which is the benzoic acid. This is the most acidic, in other words, the most reactive. So let's take a look at the reaction of benzoic acid with sodium bicarbonate. Okay, our sodium bicarbonate, there's a full plus charge on the metal. This is an ionic bond, 
full plus charge on the metal and a full negative charge on the bicarbonate portion. Now again, I've just mentioned this is a weak base. And the benzoic acid is going to be our acid. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the reaction. I'm going to show you the mechanism for the reaction here. All acid, uh, this is a Bronsted-Lowry acid base reaction. And all Bronsted-Lowry acid base reactions work exactly the same. They all have the same mechanism. You learn this one mechanism and you've instantly learned thousands and thousands and thousands of reactions. So let's take a look at our mechanism. The mechanism is the base always goes in and gets the acidic proton off of the acid. Our most acidic proton, if you look at all the hydrogens that we have here, the most acidic proton is the one on the oxygen. That oxygen is electronegative pulling electrons away from the hydrogen. That's a polar bond. So there's partial positive charge on the proton, partial negative charge on the oxygen. Now if you look at our base, we have a full negative charge on the bicarbonate ion. That is going to come and get the hydrogen off of our acid the electrons in this oxygen-hydrogen bond, those go on to the oxygen. Now these curved arrows, they work just like we did for resonance the other day in lecture. You're showing the flow of electrons. This, this is where we're moving electrons. Now there was two lone pairs, if you want to show them, you don't have to, but there was two lone pairs on the oxygen. Now there's three lone pairs. Those electrons went up onto the oxygen. The bicarbonate, let's take a look at the bicarbonate. This is what it looks like drawn out. So it's this oxygen with the negative charge. That's what went and got the hydrogen. So we also have carbonic acid there as a byproduct. Again, we're forming a bond between the oxygen and that hydrogen. That's what went and got the hydrogen. That's where it winds up. Now let's get our charges on. Initial tail, so just like what we did with resonance, initial tail becomes more negative by, uh, more positive by charge, sorry, more positive by charge. Positive and negative cancels out, that option is now neutral. Final head, where we ended up, final head becomes more negative by charge. That oxygen was neutral, it will now have a full negative charge. So there are our products. Now, if you want to show it, I don't care whether you show it or not. We are organic chemists now. This is not gene chem. All we care about is the organic portion. By the way, the, this will break apart and give water and carbon dioxide. Uh, so. Water that's going to be in the water layer, of course, and carbon dioxide gas will bubble out. So this is gone. This is what we're concerned with. If you want to show it, the sodium is a spectator ion. And it just floats along and balances charge out. It is not involved in the mechanism. You can see our curved arrows. There's the curved arrows. That's our mechanism. The base goes and gets the proton off the acid and we leave the electrons on that oxygen. Sodium was not involved in the mechanism. It just floats along and balances charge out. So it's going to go wherever it can associate with whatever has a negative charge. 
So if you want to show it, you can. If you don't, I don't care. Again, it's a metal. We don't care about metals here in organic. But it would float along and bounce a charge out here if you want to show it. If you don't, that is perfectly fine. Again, it's not involved in the mechanism. It's a spectator ion. It's just watching everything go on. Now, there's the mechanism for our reacting with the sodium saturated sodium bicarbonate. Now, what have we accomplished? What did, why did we do this? The benzoic acid that we had was soluble in the ether. All the compounds were soluble in ether. I'm just going to say ether. I know it's the T-butyl methyl ether, but let's just call it ether. And our product, this is a salt, especially if you show the sodium there, it's a salt, very similar to like sodium chloride or something like that. It's just an organic salt. And what do we know about salts? Salts are soluble in water. So now we have a salt that is soluble in water. And so we have separated it from the other compounds. All the other compounds, the mixture of the three compounds, they were all in the ether. And now one of them is in the water layer. So this is how we are separating them using this acid base reaction. Now we go back to our procedure. It says to draw off the lower aqueous layer. This week is different than what we had last week. This week, the water layer will be on the bottom and the organic layer is on top because of uh, the densities of the, the ether and the water. So ether layer is on top, organic layer on top, and the water layer is on the bottom. So it says to draw off the lower aqueous layer and place that into tube labeled B. You're going to add another approximately, doesn't have to be exact, approximately 0.15 mils of saturated bicarbonate to tube A. Put your septum back on top, mix it, allow the layers to separate, and again draw off the lower layer and place that into B as well. This is just to make certain that we get all of this into tube B. So again, that is in our water layer. Now, now this is in tube B now. And we have separated it out. But that's not what I want. I want to separate the original compounds. I want benzoic acid back. I don't want the salt. I want benzoic acid. So, if you follow your flow chart, we're going to go to the other side of the second page of your procedure. And it tells you what to do with the tube B now. The tube B... We are going to add, carefully add, concentrated hydrochloric acid, dropwise, and you need to mix it really well as you add. Um, you don't want to use your septum here because you're going to be adding a drop and then you need to mix and you add a drop and you need to mix and so you don't want to be taking the septum on and off. So just use... Um, Use the glass stirring rod that's in your kit. You have a glass stirring rod. So add a few drops, a couple drops. Take your glass stirring rod, mix it really well. Add a couple drops, mix as you're adding. And then it says test with blue litmus paper. The blue litmus paper should turn red. Don't even bother testing until you see a precipitant. 
there's no reason to test until you see a precipitant. So let's see what the precipitant is. Let's take a look at the reaction and see why we have a precipitant. Okay, so we're adding hydrochloric acid to 2B, which has our salt in it. Now this is another acid-base reaction. We have added hydrochloric acid. That's a very strong acid. This is our acid. So the other compound does not have a choice. It has to be the base. So this is another acid-base reaction. Now, so let's work this one out. Let's look at the mechanism of this reaction. It's the exact same mechanism as what we had here at the top. The base goes and gets the proton off of the acid. The base, that negative charge, the base goes and gets the proton off of our acid. That proton has got partial positive charge and the chlorine has partial negative because of the difference in electronegativity. Chlorine is a lot more electronegative. So our base is attracted to that partial positive. Put the lone pairs on there. It's the electrons that are going. So this is going to go get the proton. I'm forming a bond between the oxygen and that hydrogen. Now hydrogen is monovalent, can only have one bond. So we have to keep the electrons out of the bond it already has if we're forming a new one. Can't have two bonds. So those electrons go onto the chlorine. So you can see it's the exact same mechanism as what we had at the top. You learned that one mechanism and you learned all Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reactions. So we get our benzoic acid back now we had kicked the electrons onto the chlorine. So if we do our charges, initial tail becomes more positive by charge, positive and negative will cancel out. That oxygen is now neutral. Final head, where we ended up, final head becomes more negative by charge, so the chlorine has a full negative charge. Sodium, our metals are always just spectator ions. Metals are never involved in the mechanism. They just float along balance charge out. So sodium would balance the charge out down here. And we have made sodium chloride as a byproduct. But we have our benzoic acid back. Now, we were in the water layer. And we're still in the water layer. This has still got water. We're adding the acid to that water layer. So where did the precipitant come from? Benzoic acid is going to precipitate out because it's not soluble in the water layer. The salt was. The salt was soluble in the water layer, but the benzoic acid is not. So you will see this precipitate out. It will come out as a solid. So when you see lots of precipitant, then test it with the litmus paper and see if you have acidified fully. When it's fully acidified, the blue litmus paper should turn red. But like I said, don't even bother testing until you see precipitate. Make certain you mix after adding the acid. Because otherwise, you add a few drops of acid and the acid just sits on top. and doesn't get down into the mixture, into the layer and have a chance to react. It's just sitting on top. So make certain you mix it well. <clears throat> okay, so... Once we've acidified and the litmus paper turned red, you're going to cool to be in an ice bath. And that's just to make certain that all of this precipitates out. And collect the solid on a Hirsch funnel. Place the crystals on weight paper, allow it to dry, and then you'll weigh that and you will calculate a percent recovery. And I'll talk about that here at the end of my lecture here today. So that is the benzoic acid. Now, back to the first page. So we've got one compound separated out now. 
but we still have a mixture. We still have the 1,4-dimethoxybenzene, and we still have the 2-naphthol that are both in the organic layer, the ether layer. So if you go back to our flow chart, the ether layer, tube A, it says to add one milliliter of three molar sodium hydroxide. Now, what do we know about sodium hydroxide? Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So we're adding a strong base. So that weaker, the weaker acid there, the two naphthol, it's weak, it was weaker than benzoic acid. So we need a stronger base to get it to react. Now, dimethoxybenzene, again, it's not acidic at all. So the two naphthol is going to react with the sodium hydroxide. So that's what we're doing here now by adding the sodium hydroxide, the one mil of sodium hydroxide. Again, this is an acid-base reaction. It's going to work like the mechanism is going to be the same as what we had before. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. The 2 naphthol has to be an acid. It doesn't have a choice. They can't both be a base. And this is a good strong base, so this has to be the acid. There is a full plus charge on the sodium, full negative charge there on the hydroxide, on the oxygen. Now our mechanism is the same, like I said, of what we did before. The base goes and gets the acidic proton off of our acid. Again, like we did before, it's the hydrogen that's on the oxygen. The oxygen's more electronegative and it's pulling the electrons away from the hydrogen. So there's partial positive on the hydrogen, partial negative on the oxygen. That hydroxide, the base, that is attracted to that hydrogen. We're gonna form a bond between that oxygen and the hydrogen, it's going to go and get that proton. The electrons in the oxygen-hydrogen bond, those are going to go on to the oxygen. Hydrogen is monovalent, can only have one bond. When we're forming a new bond, you got to break the old one. So let's draw what we have. Hydroxide grabbed the hydrogen, so that made water. Now let's get our charges on. Initial tail becomes more positive by charge, so positive and negative cancel out. So that oxygen is now neutral. Of course, water is neutral. Final head, where we ended up, final head becomes more negative by charge. That oxygen was neutral, it will now have a full negative charge. And again, the sodium is just a spectator ion. It is not involved in the mechanism. It's just floating along and bouncing charge. If you want to show it, you can. If you don't, you can just leave it like it is there. But it would balance the charge out here if you want to show it. So there is our reaction for the second part. So what have we accomplished? We did the exact same thing as we did before. We have taken something that was soluble in ether and made it soluble in water. This is a salt. So now this is in the water layer. So we have separated those two compounds. So you're gonna take your pasture pipette, draw off the lower aqueous layer, the water layer, and place that into tube C. It says to add two 
0.1 mil portions of water to tube A, draw off. Now, don't add it, two of them in there at the same time. Otherwise, why don't you just add 0.3? Twice, you're gonna do 0.15 mils. So add 0.15 mils, approximately, doesn't have to be exact, of water, deionized water. You always, in any procedure, we always wanna use the deionized water. So you're gonna add that to tube A, shake it up, let the layer separate, and draw off that lower layer and add that to tube C as well. That again is just making certain we get all this out of tube A and into tube C. We wanna make certain we get all of it in there. So you're gonna do that twice. We did it once there. So again, once you've separated the layers, again, add 0.1 mils of deionized water, shake it, let the layers separate, Draw off the lower aqueous layer and add that to tube C. So we're doing that twice. So again, it's to make certain we get all of that into tube C. Okay, so now we have this separated out into tube C. But I don't want that. I want to naphthol. So we've got to get it back. So if you follow tube C, go to the second page and it tells you what to do with tube C. It says carefully add concentrated hydrochloric acid dropwise and that should be with mixing. Mix with a glass stirring rod just like you did there before with tube B. Let me just redraw that over here. hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, this is a very strong acid. So our organic compound doesn't have a choice. It has to be the base. So we're going to have another acid-base reaction. There's partial negative on the chlorine, partial positive on the hydrogen because of the difference in electronegativity. So just like we did before, always the same mechanism, the base goes and gets the proton off the acid. It's this oxygen with that negative charge, that oxygen with a full negative is attracted to that partial positive. We're going to form a bond between that oxygen and that hydrogen. Now hydrogen can only have one bond, so if we're forming one, we have to break the old bond. So those electrons go on to the chlorine. So we get our two naphthol back. We get the two naphthol back. And we kick the electrons on to the chlorine. Now let's get our charges. Initial tail becomes more positive by charge, uh, charge. So positive and negative will cancel out. That option is now neutral. Final head becomes more negative by charge, chlorine was neutral, it will now have a full negative charge. Sodium floated along and bounced the charge out. So again, we get sodium chloride as a byproduct. It will stay in the water. As you know it's a salt, water soluble, it stays in the water layer. But our two naphthol, remember we're in the water layer here. This was soluble in water, but once we protonate it, now it's insoluble in water. So it will precipitate out. This will precipitate out. And we can collect that on a Hirsch funnel once it precipitates out. You'll collect it on a Hirsch funnel. Allow it to dry. You put it on a piece of weight paper, allow it to dry. Weigh it, and we'll calculate a percent recovery for it. And again, I'll tell you how to do that here at the end. Okay, so that part was the same as what we had done there previously uh, with 2B. We're just acidifying with hydrochloric acid, 
do another acid base so we can get our compound back. Now if you go back to the first page and still follow the flow chart down, so we still have 2A to deal with and 2A now we have pulled out benzoic acid and we've pulled out two naphthols, separated those out. So 2A, all that's left in 2A is our 1,4-dimethoxy benzene. Now it says to 2A, add one and a half milliliters of saturated sodium chloride. Now what is the purpose of that? Saturated sodium chloride. Let's think about it. What happens if you eat something? Saturated sodium chloride, uh, sodium chloride, sodium chloride, just salt, table salt. What happens if you eat something really salty? Makes you thirsty, doesn't it? Because the salt pulls the water out of your body. Makes you thirsty. That's what it's gonna do here. Sodium chloride, saturated sodium chloride, is going to pull any water out of tube A. We're trying to dry it. So the saturated sodium chloride, I like to explain it as pre-drying. Last week we used the anhydrous calcium chloride pellets and we're going to do that again this week. But you notice last week you had to use, a, some of you had to use a lot of pellets to get it dry. This is going to help us not to have to use so many pellets. We're going to pre-dry it with a saturated sodium chloride solution. So it gets most of the water out, but not all of it. It'll get the majority. So um, in the past, I've explained it as, uh, think about when you do laundry. When you wash your clothes, the washing machine goes through, a, there at the end, after they've washed, it goes through a spin cycle to get rid of most of the water. Doesn't get rid of all of it. Your clothes are still wet, but he got rid of all, the majority of it. Then you have to put them in the dryer to finish drying. The spin cycle was our pre-drying, like our saturated sodium chloride. That's the pre-dry, get rid of most of the water. Then you put your clothes in the dryer and finish drying. Them. That's the anhydrous calcium chloride. That will get rid of the rest of the water. So we have the saturated sodium chloride to pre-dry, the anhydrous calcium chloride pellets to finish drying it. Okay, so it says to add one and a half mils saturated sodium chloride to tube A, remove the lower water layer and discard that. We don't need that anymore. And to the ether layer, the top layer, the ether layer, you're adding the anhydrous calcium chloride pellets. And give it at least five or 10 minutes, 10 minutes would be best to fully dry. Again, just like last week with the pellets, when you flick the tube, you're looking to see at least if there's one or two pellets that can move around. And then that gives you some indication that it's dry. Uh, that ether layer should also become very clear. You should be able to see through it. If it's still got some water in it, it'd be cloudy because the organic and the water have different refractive indexes and that makes it cloudy. So when the water's gone, it should be nice and clear. You should be able to see through it very well. So, um, separate the ether from the pellets and you're gonna place that into tube D and it says tube D needs to be teared. So weigh tube D, tube, I can't remember, tube D ahead of time, should be a teared tube. Weigh it on the balance. Write that down, record that, and then place the ether into the tube D, the ether layer. You're gonna evaporate the ether from tube D. Now the procedure, I need to get this changed. It says using a water bath. We're gonna use our sand baths. Um, we'll use our sand baths to evaporate off. So put a boiling stick in there and then put the tube in, a, in your sand bath. Now once all the ether is evaporated, uh, we'll weigh tube D and you'll calculate a percent recovery. That is the 1,4-dimethoxybenzene. So we have separated all three compounds from the mixture now. And we have weights on all of them. Now I want you to, like I said, I want you to calculate a percent recovery. 
for each of them. So you'll have three percent recoveries to calculate. This is percent recovery, not percent yield. Percent yield is when we make a new compound. Percent recovery is when we get the same compound back that we started with. And that's what we're doing. We had a mixture and we separated them, but it's the same compounds at the end. We've got the same three compounds. We didn't make anything new. So this is percent recovery. Now we started with 180 milligrams or 0.18 grams of the mixture. And I mix this up as a one to one to one mixture. It's an equal mixture of the three compounds. So we can just divide that by three. So there should be 60 milligrams of each. Now, if you didn't start with 180, let's say whatever you, you should have recorded that, whatever you started with, uh, if you started with, you know, 200, just divide it by three and see what your, what our theoretical should be. This is our theoretical amount for each one of the compounds. So your percent recovery is the actual amount. whatever you actually weighed for each of the three compounds divided by the theoretical. Times 100%. And again, our theoretical is the 60 milligrams or whatever you calculate there. So just divide whatever you started with by three and that will be your theoretical for each of these because it's an equal mixture. So you will have 3% recoveries to calculate. Again, do that for each of the three compounds. Okay, that is our lab this week. Uh, for disposal, uh, the, when you're finished, the three compounds will go in the non-halogenated waste container all of the water layers that you have uh, that's left, uh, water layers can go down the drain. You know, just those three compounds need to go in the non-halogenated waste. Everything else, everything else is just salts and water, so they can all go down the drain.